Hello YouTube. In this video, this will be the very first in a series of videos I'm very excited to make. This is basically going to be the... I've been collecting keyboards for several months, and I have accumulated enough to make about an ounce of silver, hopefully, or maybe even um, a significant amount close to gram, or even maybe even more than that. So, basically, I will be documenting the entire process from start to finish, so you can look at my other videos that I have up where I show you how to scrap a keyboard, and inside each keyboard, there are little thin plastic sheets known as mylars, which have in every keyboard about half a gram of silver. So, yeah, they add up pretty quickly, and they're worth a lot of money if you collect enough of them. And, and a significant amount of silver metal. So, basically, the first thing I want to do is whenever I uh, start to collect these, and if I'm going, since I'm going to be processing them myself, I need to be sure that I have all proper safety equipment, like fume hoods and other various equipment, like personal protective equipment. And keep in mind that this process will require the use of nitric acid, which today some nitric acid came in the mail. Now, I haven't opened it up yet because I don't really want to deal with it until I get to the lab, which is at my college. But um, I'm going to have to pay some extra money for hazardous materials charges. I bought this acid off of Science Company, but as you can see there, it says other than red fuming, with at least 65%, but not more than 70% nitric acid. And I get some nice little sticker labels on here, like corrosive and oxidizer. So be aware that you may encounter some of these issues depending on your situation, but this corrosive warning obviously tells um, you to be careful when dealing with this kind of acid. So you want to wear some acid-resistant gloves but keep in mind that whenever it reacts with metal, unlike a lot of YouTube videos, people shouldn't be using masks because even though you feel like it's going to give you a sense of security, it really doesn't because nitrogen dioxide or NOxes are produced whenever it reacts with different metals like silver, especially copper, and that will create and generate a great deal of orange-red gas. That's a common red, uh, common air pollutant in major cities and one of the causes of smog. Nitrogen dioxide can result in poisoning, known as nitrogen dioxide poisoning. It's a pretty nasty poisoning that you can get from exposure to nitrogen dioxide from the nitric acid. And if you get higher than the 70%, close to 100, you'll get something called red fuming. It doesn't necessarily have to be 100, but when it's a higher concentration, above 70%, you'll get red fuming. But if you go even higher, close to 100% purity, you'll get something called white fuming. And both red fuming and white fuming are caused from just how powerful and concentrated it is that already starts seducing those toxic gases. White fuming is especially dangerous, as you can't see the fumes, or if you can, it's a very white colored to clear colored gas. So please be careful when dealing with this stuff, and be sure to wear chemical resistant gloves when you're opening it, and be sure you do it under a fume hood, because if you do it outside, there won't be any protection against the fumes that may hit your face. So yeah, that was a pretty long speech, but it's just important to talk about and when you're dealing with any kind of chemicals, be sure to download the material safety data sheet and be sure to also do a lot of research on the topics and browsing Labor Steve's Gold Recovery US website as well as going on the Gold Refining Forum and getting some information there. YouTube can't always be a one hundred percent provider of adequate information because you can post anything you want on this website and a lot of amateurs post things like uh, post topics on this 
um, but they don't know a lot of experience with it. But um, go to finding form has a simple go to find form search, and you'll get a lot of information um, about things you'll need and other various safety procedures. That there's a section I believe on MSDSs, the serial safety data sheets before and before you deal with any chemicals, be sure to read through all those um, sheets and understand the risks and be ready to have anything you need in case of an emergency like a spill or if it gets in your eyes, face, or skin. The MSDSs will tell you what to do. So yeah, the, without further ado, I'll show you the first thing you'll need is, of, of course, your keyboard monitors. Be sure you save them because they do have a lot of silver on them, like I said before. And also, try to only process the silver mylars um, with um, all the silver exposed. So in this case, all the silver is nice and visible. However, there is an unacceptable kind of silver mylar. So about the camera anyway, but um, this is... So there's a different stack of things I'm collecting. This is an example of an acceptable kind of mylar. You can see the shining gray, or in this case, white color of the silver traces. However, when you flip it over on the exposed side, it's covered in carbon and plastic. So this kind is not acceptable to process. So you have to incinerate it or melt away all the plastic, leaving behind your silver before processing like the other kinds of mylars. So, Another kind of silver mylar is there's an acceptable one of semi-exposed pieces where one side has exposed silver and on the other side the traces are covered other than the contact points. In most cases, the covered pieces can be cut away processing this kind of incineration leaving behind silver traces. Um, the small pieces with incineration leaving behind silver traces with no covering. Um, and then the silver traces left behind can be processed with the others, um, just like the ordinary mylars. Up to times, however, one doesn't have time to drop this in the incineration, and if managed correctly, it will burn away all the plastics present in the sheet of silver, leaving behind nice silver. Beware, however, that there could be a smell, and you could be exposed to some toxic gases like dioxins, furans, um, and other nasty chemicals. Not just gases, but toxic compounds, like what I've said before. So keep in mind, but if you do have some clean sheets like this, next thing you want to do is, depending on the situation, you may not need to cut them, but because I'll be using this Pyrex glass dish that's been cleaned, it looks a bit blurry on the camera, but it is definitely clean. Just some unremovable stains. That shouldn't be a problem. Be sure your dish says Pyrex on it. The Pyrex marking should be visible on the camera. It means it has borosilicate, which is suitable for our process. Be sure you get Pyrex. That's the only going to be the lab grade glass. If you don't have any access to any kind of good science, specifically science equipment, to hold your mylars. When you dissolve them in a nitric acid bath, you'll probably need to do some shopping as um, it's not a good idea to use any container that has come in contact with chemicals in your cooking. I got those from Goodwill, but this was only found for $1.99 and this other piece on the right, which is quite similar to a crystallization dish, um, which is very expensive, I got for about $5.99. So it's a little expensive, but much better than having to buy a whole set of Pyrex when you're not able to use some of it as it's not suitable. In this case, I'll need to cut each minor into six pieces in order them to fit them inside here, inside the little rectangular dish. I'll have to make it about this size um, with a pair of scissors so you can see the size comparison. And um, you just use a pair of scissors, like I said. And um, so, yeah, it's pretty simple and straightforward. And I cut away any loose pieces of mylar and any parts that are sticking out. And I don't need to deal with that piece when, um, as it's already small. So, 
put that to the side. There's my other pieces down there, as you can see. That this should have a clean sheet with nothing flimsy attached to the mylar. So, it's pretty flesh. The whole thing is just one piece, nothing's loose and flipping around. So, then I cut the mylar into three pieces. There is one cut that I'm making right now. Alright, and um, now the other remaining piece will be cut in half. So, yeah, it's pretty rough thirds, but it's close enough. Now, I'll cut each of those thirds in half, resulting in six pieces. Even though it multiplies my work by two, it now fits in my glass container. As you can see, it fits in pretty nicely. Now, it isn't necessary to cut them exactly in half, as you can really just eyeball it. But if you feel more in the eye of precision, you can do a slight crease by doing a fold over, and then the other end. Um, you open it up, and um, now you see a nice crease line, and you just cut right along that. You can do it um, for each and every one of those mylar sheets of your pieces of silver. So, yeah, that's pretty much the conclusion of the video and the first overall step in the preparatory process. So as you can see, I have a whole bunch I've already pre-cut, a whole bunch that have been partially processed, and this is what I have to do. I have all of this. So it's a pretty good amount, and the large amount I have here, and yeah, um, they're really, they're really easy to get to get keyboards everywhere and if you have good contacts like people contacts you can get quite a few of these easily so yes just keep hoarding those monitors up and if you have a piece covered in adhesive like from laptops um, incineration is really the only way to go to get this over one final thing to keep in mind though Whenever you're dealing with silver, the only real problem is the laptops. Um, some of the silver traces will be UV placed. And um, you'll use a UV method. Um, it's sort of silk screened like in keyboard desktops. If they are UV printed, be aware that they will have a different texture and will feel a lot more flatter than the actual feeling of bumpiness. Those will not be suitable for the process that we will be going to be going about. To, yeah, to wrap up on this video, I went over some background information, including some precautions about chemical used, a few pieces of equipment I will use, and a first step in a long process of recovering silver, followed by some additional processing information. This experiment I will be working on my own, and I got the information I needed from the Gold of Finding form and from Laser City's website, goldrecovery.us. In the next video, I will show you the next complete process from next step to finish. Thanks for watching, and I will see you later. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Actually, no, that shouldn't be right, because this will just be a continuation in the next part. Coming right up. So yeah, the first thing I will do is refill my wash bottle with deionized water. This special water has gone under a different process of purification than distilled water, and doesn't have any minerals or impurities compared to distilled water. As a result, this water has no chance of causing any undesired reactions from the trace amounts of minerals and will fit the application I need. I basically twist the knob on the water tank and begin filling. And when I am done, 
all I have to do is just twist the knob on the wire, um, on the valve to the closed position and replace the cap on my wash bottle. It's now ready for use and I will go to the next step in preparation. So the next step involves washing my laboratory glass. Here I have my two different Pyrex glassware as shown in a previous segment as well as a couple more pieces of glassware like this graduated cylinder which I'll wash first. So I will first rinse with ordinary non-potable water which you would find at the lab. So second, I use a wash bottle with this filled with a solution of baking soda and water known as a aqueous solution. I use a liberal amount of it, cleaning the tip of the cylinder first, followed by a good cleaning of the inner surface of the graduate cylinder. I shake the solution and dump out the contents. Now I'll begin to wash out a beaker the same way. Rinse with water. Followed by a cleaning with baking soda, both on the rim and inner surface. And I put that on a cart that is behind me that is currently not visible. I repeat the process on another beaker. So as you can see, I rinse it, then I use the wash bottle on all parts of the um, glass and dump it out. Now I will clean the glass stirring rods. Uh, first I rinse with water and spray on the aqueous solution onto the rods. It's as simple as that as there are no inner surfaces to worry about. Apologize for the dog in the background, but anyway. Um, my, so I repeat on the second speaker. Okay, so yeah, I paused the video and so now um, I let it in and now I'm back. So I just finished washing both stirring rods and now I, um, it's pretty simple. And so now, as there are no inner surfaces on the stirring rods, so now my last beaker is washed the same way as the other beakers. They don't take too long. Now, however, these larger Pyrex dishes are a lot more time consuming. I rinse the glassware. And I clean the outside of the glass with the baking soda solution. And so it's followed by an inner wash. So I dump it out and I will repeat with the other glass bowl. Now this bowl takes much longer to do than the previous glassware as it's rounded and hard to get to the entire piece. So as you can see, um, I just washed the inside. So now I'm just washing the outside again. And when and that's done, I will now wash and rinse the last glass rod. And I'm done with the red six step. So now you can see my cart set up. So um, that's the things I'll need is present on this world contraption. Um, you can see my entire bag of mylar cut it ready to go. Uh, the fume hood is present adjacent to the cart. So yeah, the Supreme Air brand, very nice brand. And there's a little sink there. 
good for doing some rinsing if needed. And an outlet with a light switch. There is a warning um, that you could see previously in red saying this water has been treated enough for humans to drink, only for use in the lab. The next step will be preparing the fume hood and setting up the experiment. Now here is some of the nitric acid that I have bought. It is 500 milliliters in volume. Um, always handle acid containers with gloves. Um, in this case, nitrile gloves. And here is a bottle of nitric acid in a jar. Which I will get right now. So as you can see, it's already prepared with a small amount of silver dissolved in solution. I had previously tested the solution by using small pieces of mylar, and it works well. So the cap is labeled with HNO3, nitric acid, and HNO3 silver nitrate, now placed on my circular dish. This will serve as a washing bowl. My rectangular dish that I'm placing down will be the main vessel where the silver will be processed. Sorry for the bad picture there. Anyway. So this is a small beaker that is there just in case I need it. So um, on the car I have rest of the items that I need. To the very left, I have a bag of silver mylar ready for processing in my wash bottle, a thermometer for a layer step, some glass stirring rods, some various beakers, a graduated cylinder, and some um, processed silver mylar. Notice how black the traces are. That's because I dissolved the silver into nitric acid solution, and the black traces are the residual carbon left on the sheets. Also, I just showed a bag of mylar for later dissolving. Some black Teflon tweezers for picking up and holding onto the mylar. Some acid resistant or nitrile gloves are necessary. A lab apron is needed. And goggles are also nice to have when working under a fume hood. Now I return to the fume hood and I lower the sash to force airflow and gases up and out of the fume hood. So take off. The first thing I want to do is take off any jewelry I have on my wrists and arms as you don't want them to be damaged from the acid or cause any unwanted reactions that could be potentially dangerous to your health. So now I'm repositioning the camera for a little bit so the contents of the fume hood are more visible. Apologize for the shakiness, that's just how it goes with the adjusting. So now um, I made a solution of nitric acid by using a one to one ratio of nitric acid and water. Now I carefully remove the cap that has the solution on it. I'm kind of in an awkward position, so it's kind of hard, but I got it eventually. And I pour the contents into the rectangular container. and I replace the cap. Put that down. So, yeah. Um, in this part, I've already placed some silver mylar. As you can see, the mylar is very dark in color compared to the white color of the mylar underneath it, as all the silver has already dissolved in the solution. So, I now pick up a piece of mylar with my tweezers and transfer it to the circular dish. So now um, I rinse the silver using the wash bottle to remove any of the possible silver solution.
After processing a few sheets of monitor for experimental purposes, I continue to experiment. So I pour all the silver nitrate bearing solution to the jar, and I had so much liquid, I had to use a second one, as you can see. Um, I labeled both the jars. The next step involves the use of sodium chloride that has been dissolved in water, putting in an aqueous solution. I use some non-iodized salt for this and filtered out the solids as there is an anti-caking agent present that does not dissolve in water that could contaminate the solution I'm adding this to. I first use 10 milliliters with a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder and draw the liquid using a plastic pipette. So, um, when I add this to the solution, you can see a definite reaction as the silver combines with the chloride ion in table salt to form silver chloride and sodium nitrate. So, the silver chloride is insoluble, resulting in dropping out of solution as a thick white solid. The solid has a texture not unlike that of college cheese. So, um, after a while, the entire jar is filled with the precipitate, kind of making it look like a glass of milk. So, I just keep adding the solution. And you can see additional um, silver chloride precipitate. So the solid is very thick. So I just go ahead and just just pour the entire thing at once um, in the pipette. So I just go ahead and just pour the entire remainder of the beaker, uh, I mean the graduate cylinder, into the um, acid, I mean, yeah, into the acid solution, which contains silver. And so now, I, after adding that extra sodium chloride in the aqueous solution, I then just stir the mixture. So, um, I've just finished um, adding, just stirring it in, and I uncapped the second jar. And instead of using a pipette, I directly pour the 10 milliliters into the jar. You can see the same beautiful reaction happen. I'm going to reposition the camera. So I had a second pour of sodium chloride. And I stir. Sorry about the dogs, they bark a lot. And so I add an additional amount of sodium chloride in the smaller volume of liquid, as I feel like it is more concentrated in values. So um, I replace the caps on both. And I will slip on the second jar when screwing it in. And that shows how important gloves are in this case. I let those jars the precipitated silver chloride set overnight. And the next week, I'll check the solutions in the jar.
So this is how they look now. As you can see, there is a whitish color solid at the bottom of each of the jars. Um, so it has settled. And now I will use an empty beaker as shown. So that's my other bottle. So now I'll pick up the empty beaker. And I have another beaker. This contains the filtered out sodium chloride solution. So I remove the funnel with the anarcho filled paper inside and use a plastic pipette and draw up some of the solution. I replace um, the filter and funnel combination on the beaker with the solution in it and put the pipette with sodium chloride solution down for a brief moment. I remove lid on one of the jars. And I pour a small amount of the clear liquid that had the solids on top into the empty beaker. I then add the contents of the pipette to the solution. Now this is to test for any additional silver cord that I may have missed. And the solution remains clear with no more precipitate flooring, which means there's no more possible silver left in the jar that isn't dropped. So this shows that I put enough um, some chlorine into the solution and have dropped out the silver chloride. I don't need to check the other one as it's kind of like a quality check type thing. Uh, showing the other one should be clean as well. So that's this step. So I'll move on to the next. Now that it is known that there's no more silver chloride in the solution, the next step will follow. So I will filter off all of the solution via gravity filtration with no use of the vacuum pump. I'll use quantitative filter paper So I'm repositioning the camera once again. And um, I will show you how to fold it. I first fold in half to make a taco shape. And then I fold the filter paper again in half and once more, making sure to tightly crease the paper. I open up the paper and fold over only one section leaving a cone shape suitable for fitting the funnel. So I just kind of make more stronger creases to have that shape better. So moving the um, funnel to the center, I place the filter paper into the funnel and reshape it inside, as you can see. Once that's done, it is ready to accept um, the solution. So I just do it right there. And I stick it back onto the um, beaker. And so now looking from a bird's eye view perspective, I use some deionized water from a wash bottle to get the sides of the paper wet so that they can adhere to the sides of the funnel better. So I go at it a second time. This time I'm twisting the funnel 
and pushing on the sides of the filter paper to force it in place. So the water acts like a glue to stick the paper to the sides, the inside of the funnel. So yeah, it sticks to the sides pretty well. So it's kind of bright, but um, it's a bit too bright. But let, me let that focus, and as you can see, it's stuck right on, which is a great sign. So I'll lower the sash a little bit. And now I uncap the, one of the jars and pour the liquid into the funnel. And I just wait for it to be filtered through. So I will wait for it to be filtered through before pouring the second time. So eventually the solution will fill up the beaker, so as a result, it will need to be disposed of. However, before it can be poured down the drain, it will need to be neutralized. Since my solution is highly acidic, baking soda is used in this application. As you can see, it's quite foamy and whenever I go ahead and pour in the acid solution it foams up because the acid is um, being neutralized by the baking soda which is a base um, so yeah pretty big bubbles and um, there's a lot of vigorous reaction going on thus losing a lot of heat And gas that's not toxic. So, as you can see, it even um, reaches the top of the um, rectangular container and accidentally it bubbles over. But this isn't a problem um, because it is neutralized but it does demonstrate the powerful neutralizing properties of baking soda. As I begin to reach the bottom of the container, um, that I'm filtering from, wait for it, I'm trying to get a good condition, good condition, I swirl it, Swirl around the um, silver chloride. I swirl it around so that the um, so I can pour out the entire contents of the jars, solid and all, into the funnel. So yeah, I keep swirling it around and it's spinning around like crazy. So I have a really bad camera angle right now for some reason. So anyway, I pour it into the funnel. And as you can see, the flow rate is quite rapid, which is a good thing. So now I move on to the next step. So now, I will um, transfer the rest of the liquids with the solids into the jar. As you can see, the solids are present in the funnel with clear solution on top. 
blurs out a lot, but for a while you could definitely see the solids. So I've dumped the rest of the solution inside the funnel. The purpose of this filtration is to separate the solids from the liquid um, and get rid of that liquid um, and neutralize it. So I'm just left with the solids by itself. So there's another close-up. So I will now um, use a wash bottle. It's just deionized water. Rinse out the jar to get the rest of the silver chloride out. You can still see the large amount of silver chloride powder still present in the jar. So I add a small amount of deionized water to regroup the silver chloride into one place. This is very time consuming. So you could just see the silver chloride at the bottom. And yeah, there you go. You can see all the powder. So now that the silver chloride is all regrouped into one place. So zooming into the funnel. So I carefully pour in all of the solution. I add a little bit of extra water so I can be sure to get all of that um, silver chloride in as much as possible. It's now at the bottom and I am currently just letting this filter out. So I'm attempting the second time to get all the solids out. So I just shake the jar. And as you can see, there's still a few small pieces still staying in the jar. So I'm just going to basically just get the rest of that out. It's very hard because of the um, neck size is smaller than the body size of the bottle, the jar, so it took a while, but eventually I got it. 
and I'm finally able to get into the solids into the jar. So the process will be repeated in the other jar. So this is how the silver chloride looks now. It has an appearance similar to cottage cheese. I washed up the silver chloride numerous times in order to achieve a clean silver chloride product. And so now I'm able to move on to the next step. So I will now dry the silver chloride powder after taking it out and neutralizing the liquid from the jar and the liquid from washing through the filter paper with tap water. Basically, I mix the baking soda with a stirring rod until it stops fizzing. I will now use this chemical known as calcium sulfate to help speed up the drying process. This dry right has an indicator in it to help see how much moisture the rocks have. In this case, it goes from blue to pink, as you can see. Um, this step is unnecessary, but it reduces waiting time drastically. As you can see in the jar, a little bit of the rocks are coming in contact with the moist filter paper, making the rocks change color. Off screen, I prepared a solution of sulfuric acid and water. I added 20 milliliters of sulfuric acid to 200 milliliters of water and stirred with an aluminum stick I cut from a computer heatsink. I let it sit overnight, trying to make it come in contact with the silver chloride. So, now, as you can tell, this is um, a little later. Um, I removed the aluminum from the jar where the solution was in. And I will use the wash bottle and rinse the aluminum to remove any additional possible silver that might be on there. By the way, there's major discoloration of the aluminum as it was eaten away by the acid. It's quite interesting. By the way, keep in mind that this reaction does evolve hydrogen gas, so don't be smoking around this or lighting any fires. So I place it down on the cap of the jar and the powder is now black instead of a purplish color showing a complete conversion of the silver powder. I pour the solution through a new filter paper until the jar is completely empty. So, as you can see, the flow rate is much slower compared to the previous uh, filtering sessions. This is a lot slower. Um, but it is still filtering, and it eventually all gets filtered. And once that's done, um, we will now move on to the final steps. So the reaction that happens is quite complex. The whole chemical reaction is known as a redox reaction, where solid aluminum reacts with the silver chloride present in aqueous solution. This is due to the presence of sulfuric acid, resulting in aluminum chloride becoming suspended in aqueous solution, and then a mental silver is left behind in silver powder form. So now I will neutralize the acid present in the filtered solution in an aluminum sheet with some more baking soda known as sodium bicarbonate, according to the label. So you can see my bath here um, with the aluminum and the um, filtered um, liquid. So we'll move on to the next step. So here I am filtering up the silver powder. So this is pretty much the final step of the process of recovering silver powder from computer keyboards. It's been a pretty long video, almost an hour long, in fact. Um, but it's pretty detailed and shows you every single step. 
Um, so, yeah, despite the shakiness right now, um, I hope you can see that there is silver powder present at the bottom. So, yeah, this is pretty, uh, this is also another time consuming step. Um, there's a lot of impurities that could be stuck in the silver powder. Um, so it's necessary to filter about five times, or even more, uh, preferably, as many times as you want. More is better. Um, so after filtering, I remove the funnel with the filter paper, and yeah, I pull out the filter paper and funnel, returning the funnel to the jar. So I fold up the filter paper, and add some deionized water to help rinse out the filter paper since I've rinsed so many times already that there shouldn't be much in there. And so I just rinse one more time over the sink, and once that's done, I pretty much completed the process of getting elemental silver. So yeah, it was a pretty long process, but I think I'm pretty happy with the result. So yeah, um, now I will have my conclusion to the video. So in the end, the process was quite enjoyable and relaxing. While it doesn't involve a lot of steps, it isn't too bad, and many steps are quite repetitive and easy to learn. Just keep in mind to always add acid to water and not the other way around as acid could start sputtering and could damage your skin. If you do this experiment, I'm not responsible for any dangers that you may encounter. Do not immediately assume that you will make money doing this and it's largely a hobby. Hope you found this video interesting and thanks for watching.